Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. We are back with another episode here in the lovely city of Chicago, Chicago Sharif. Slowly beginning to wrap our trip here. I'm joined as always by my co-host uh, Omar Ansari. Hey, assalamualaikum everyone. I am just floored and super impressed just by everything that's going on in Chicago. Mm. And we are here at the Khalil Center. That's right. And once again, I'm very impressed because the facility is absolutely yeah, amazing and really, really beautiful. Is. I love attention to detail and I love the pursuit and the and the interest of keeping things in that pursuit of Ahsan and excellence. So we are joined by Dr. Human Geshavarzi, who is a licensed psychotherapist in the state of Illinois. He holds a doctorate of, of psychology and master's of clinical psychology and a bachelor's of science with a specialist a psychology track minor in Islamic studies. He is currently a visiting scholar of the Ibn Khaldun University in Istanbul, Turkey, adjunct professor at the American Islamic College right here in Chicago, the Hartford Seminary, and of course, the founding director of Khalil Center, the first Islamically oriented professional community mental wellness center and largest Muslim mental health services in the United States. He is also a fellow at the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding at the Global Health Center, conducting research on topics related to Muslims and mental health. He is a international public speaker, trainer, currently serving as the clinical supervisor of graduate students of, of clinical psychology at the village of Hoffman Estates. Uh, Dr. Keshavarzi is also the author of several academic papers that, that are recognized in peer-reviewed journals and which integrate, or he writes extensively about integrating Islamic spirituality into modern psychological practice. And I'm extremely excited to have you join us, Dr. Human. Alhamdulillah, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you all as my guests, mashallah, That's here right. in here at the Khalil Center here in Chicago. So we're yeah. at the uh, Khalil Center headquarters. Sorry. Yes, we are. We're uh, here in know. Lombard, Illinois. Alhamdulillah. 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 You know, the Khalil Center has been a uh, household name for me, specifically calling Chicago home as well mm -hmm. as calling the Bay Area home. Mm -hmm. And those being the two homes also to Khalil Center mm -hmm. and knowing some of the clinical psychologists, we'd love to get into that history and we'd love to sort of explore that. Sure. Uh, but before we do, as we often like to do, is if our listeners could learn a little bit more about you, about your background, your mm -hmm. training, where are you from originally yeah. growing yeah. up? Sure. Yeah, I can speak to that definitely. So uh, I was born actually in Ankara, Turkey, uh, okay. the capital of Turkey for... Yes. And I was there until I was about six years old, and we migrated as a family to uh, Toronto, Canada. And so I grew up and spent most of my formative years in Toronto, Canada. And um, that's where I went to high school. That's where I did my bachelor's uh, at the University of Toronto. Um, and, you know, during high school, I always had this sort of, I wouldn't say early high school, I had this kind of spiritual awakening myself. I, I'm sure many of the listeners and you guys know that Toronto, Canada is quite a diverse place. In fact, yeah. in some parts of Toronto, the minority populations make up the majority in number, <laughs> right? That's right. That's um, right. And there's a very vibrant and large Muslim community and very multicultural. And so growing up in a very multicultural area in Toronto, Scarborough, I want to say, okay. um, I came to into contact with a lot of Muslims from different cultural backgrounds, um, you know, uh, a sort of Middle Eastern, Arab, all sorts of different Arab countries, North North Africa, Africans, Pakistani, Indians. And my family was not very religious or practicing. And so I didn't really grow up with Islam. And, you know, that in Turkey and um, I, we originally hailed from Azerbaijan province of Iran, oh. which is a Turkish speaking kind of region. Okay. And so we speak a Turkish dialect as it is. Oh. And so, you know, sort of growing up in more of a secular household, I always had this question of what is it to be a Muslim or what does Islam mean, especially as I came into contact with other Muslims. Okay. And so I felt that there was something almost missing in my identity, this sort of name of being a Muslim, but I didn't really know what that meant or what it was. So growing up in in uh, Toronto, you weren't necessarily affiliated with any of the, like, say, major Islamic centers there? Mm, I know not initially. Quite not a initially. few. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have are you and are you talking the 1990s? Uh, this is actually, yeah, this is late 90s, uh, early 2000s. Mm, okay. 
No, yeah. I was also curious. Your late, your your name. Late nineties, yeah, yeah. Late nineties. Uh, your name is uh, Turkic, or is it uh, Farsi? It's Persian. Farsi is a okay. Persian name, actually. Human as well, and yeah, Keshavarzi. And Keshavarzi as well. Okay. Yes, it is. Is that uh, the Keshavarzi name comes from the region? That region that of region. Azerbaijan. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Okay. Because I first time I'm coming across both of those names. Uh, yeah, Keshavar. Yeah, it means. Yeah. Uh, uh, like Keshvaj in Farsi means like farm, basically. So we're okay. so we're like farmer, you know. Got so it. it's equivalent to farmer, basically. And, and human, <laughs> and human just means like good natured, kind of good, uh, good soul. Okay. And as you probably know, across kind of Turkish history and Turkic yeah. peoples, they uh, adopted Farsi as well yeah. as a language. That's so you right. get a lot of sort of intermixing mm -hmm. of. Uh, Farsi and Turkic and sort of cultures and yeah. language as well. Our mother tongue is Urdu, so for yeah. uh, of course uh, Urdu uh, incorporates from both of those languages. Absolutely, definitely, you know, yeah, definitely, to, you know. definitely. But uh, okay, so so sorry. Going back to Toronto, uh, and also just to, that you know, I mean, my wife was very young when she left, but she was born in Mississauga. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, my so she had roots when, there. when I was growing up, Mississauga was like very new and okay. developing, right. and so it felt like a very far place right <laughs> <They're> <laughs> and the, now it's like you right. know it's part of the gta greater toronto yeah. area and yeah. you know when somebody said you know going out to mississauga i was like oh where is that you know <laughs> and, and uh, being in being, coming to the chicagoland area i'm just um really amazed just by the infrastructure amongst the muslims mm -hmm. but dare i say toronto might look might look even more diverse than chicago For sure. Which it is, is which, which is something definitely more diverse. I, I would, I would agree. Yeah, uh, way more diverse. Probably a little, a little bit larger in terms of the Muslim population. I that, would imagine, although Chicago is quite uh, close. Yeah. I want to say to, yeah. uh, to Toronto and sort of even demographics of the Muslim community yeah, are similar. Uh, to to a degree. Okay. To a degree. Because similar. I. Canada always strikes me as uh, it's not quite like like England or you know European immigration looked very different. Yeah, and it's not quite American immigration it's kind of either. In between. It's kind of in between, where it's like <laughs> a lot of people came as uh, as, as class, labor class, uh, yeah. working class. Other people came for higher education and Correct. stayed there. So you kind of have that kind of blend, the right? Mix. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so when do you have that spiritual awakening? Yeah, as you I want to say it was probably like when even yet as young as 14, 15 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I was in high school, um, right across the street uh, from my high school is Abu Bakr Masjid. It's in Scarborough, uh, Midland and Lawrence, where my home was, um, where we lived and where we grew up, where I grew up, at least for my adolescent years. And I started to interact with a lot of Muslims and, uh, you know, sort of, they used to ask me like, what, uh, you know, are you Muslim? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, do you pray? I said, well, no, not really. Do you go, do you fast? And I said, no, I don't. And they're like, well, what kind of Muslim are you then? <laughs> you know, what does that mean? So I started to explore that. And then actually I started to explore my family really values reason and rationality and education and academia and so I started to really pursue an a, attempted sort of at that age at least I don't know how objective you can be an attempted objective sort of quest into religion and theology and just kind of, kind of exploring all the different theologies and and, and and religious traditions and concluded pretty quickly that Islam seemed to make the most coherent sense and was most reasonable and I started to adopt it, actually. And I remember one of my early experiences was going into the masjid. Uh, this was kind of funny because it was Halloween and it fell during Ramadan. And I was with Muslim friends and we were, uh, unfortunately, like egging some houses. <laughs> As an adolescent, but they stopped and they said, I love the fact that you fess up to it now because, <laughs> yeah, if we're going to start confessing egging houses, you know, guilty as charged, sir. So, <laughs> wrapping, wrapping houses, know, egging right. houses. Sorry. Paper egg, were you too you good, know? Omar? Omar is like, Omar was way too straight laced. <laughs> now I'm like, man, did I miss out on an experience? No. You did. Uh, CD, he's way too straight laced. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah, mashallah, mashallah. Yeah, um, so the, so my friends, they stopped and they said, hey, it's Ramadan. Let's stop and go pray at least two rakats of tarawih. Okay. And I was like, uh, okay. I mean, they're like, you're Muslim. It's Ramadan. Why don't you just come with us? Yeah. 
I was like, well, I don't really know how to pray, but okay. And so I, I went inside. I heard the Adhan for the first time in the Western world. And I think as a child, mm. it's probably built into my subconscious somewhere and, and built into sort of a familiar memory. But it yeah. really evoked something in me that I felt like a sense of home, almost like a finding of something that was lost and feeling of being whole. And it was a very profound wow. experience. As I walked in the masjid, the adhan was going off. And so that was a profound experience for me. And I would say that was quite a, a pivotal and transformative experience for me is when I really decided to take things more seriously at that time. While many adolescents were kind of going and, you know, I don't know, messing around or whatnot, I was reading theology and I was debating my father and you know, good conversation and 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 watching you know videos and going and talking to the imam. The imam barely spoke any English, so yeah, okay. he had a very difficult time communicating. But despite that, I was probably like the only adolescent doing this, and he was very appreciative of right. the fact that somebody was this inquisitive and interested in um, in in theology. And so, I mean, the short of it is that I eventually started practicing religion and gradually started to want to study and learn more about theology and religion. And, um, and so I started attending halaqat and durus and kind of starting to adopt friendship circles over time. I don't want to say them fast forwarding. I don't think no, no, I don't sure, want to say this sure. happened you know, overnight, you mean, but a right. gradual process. How was and, the uh, response from your family? I mean, were they a little yeah, concerned? Well, you know, to be to begin, not really. Okay. I mean, they said, you know, religion is, is good. You know, right. you want to pray. That's, that's wonderful. Um, however, just don't overdo it, basically. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> and, you know, lo and behold, I started to overdo it and made it a part of my, you know, life. And yeah. they said, don't make it a part of your, like, core part of your life is something that you do you sort of do at the masjid and right. whatnot, keep it on the side compartmentalized and, yeah and so uh you know and coming full circle from the lab a very good relationship with them and they were you know have a great deal of respect and i think uh, appreciation for what i do and we have a great sort of relationship with both of my parents but there was a period of time in which uh, they were a bit resistant to the idea yeah. of growing a beard and wearing a kufi and going to the masjid all the time and right. going to these halaqat and durus and like reading uh, all sorts of books and literature and kind of making it a focal part of my, uh, my my life and wearing Islamic garb and that sort of thing. In terms of leaders slash scholars that I'm, my list is very limited, but in Toronto, I would imagine you had uh, Dr. Uh, Abdullah Idris Ali. Was he there at the time? Uh, you know, Abdullah I, Hakim Quick. Yeah, yeah, Abdullah Hakim yeah, Quick was yeah, there, definitely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I was on the east side of town. Uh -huh. I had uh, Salah al um, you know, Imam Ali Hindi was oh, uh, the Imam okay. there. So okay. I used to go to his khutbahs. Um, Moana Qasim, who was the Imam uh, of the uh, Masjid Abu Bakr. Okay, okay. And so I used to go and I used to ask him questions right. all the time. And then Mufti Yusuf uh, uh, Malla, uh, he has a, sh a Sharia kind of Arabic yeah. program. Yeah, he so did. I actually joined that very early on. And This is before undergrad or this after? This is before undergrad, during, okay. actually during high school. And then I continued that on into undergraduate. Mashallah. And he had just started to come yeah. back. Do you have to studies. learn Arabic? I started to mm. uh, to learn it then, yeah. um, very part time kind of basis, and you know I went to um, the University of Toronto, and then I became interested in Tasawwuf as well okay. early on, um, and uh, I want to say that was sort of a natural sort of process, and I was reading like Sheikh Nuh Keller's bo books and material. Although I didn't really have much contact with any of his circle or community uh, over there. Um, I took, I was doing a major in psychology, or actually I did a specialist in psychology, which means that you don't declare any other major or minor, it's just one thing. I That's see. That's what the, I see. we had that option. In. Yeah, when I was reading that, I wasn't familiar with that yeah. the path. It's called right. specialist. It's a specialist. So okay. you just basically declare one thing, you do all right. your, majority of your courses in that set of electives. Mm -hmm. So I did those electives in all, whatever Islamic studies was available, I did it. Okay. <clears throat> and there was like a course in Sufism and mysticism in Islam. And uh, I took that and I became very fond of it. And just to kind of speed, speed it up, sort of the story of a long uh, story is that I also then uh, started to, I met actually my sheikh, Mohammed Muhammad Zakaria, who was in Toronto. And I started attending his durus and his halaqat. 
Um, and is, he, is, is he based there or he was just visiting? Him. Okay, he's based Mishra. in Toronto and uh, Masjid Taqwa. Masjid okay. Taqwa mm-hmm. in Toronto. And uh, when I met him, I felt like this is the real deal. Like, you yeah. know, when I was right. like reading about it, I was attending this or- Orientalist, like Sufism class, yeah. or a perennialist kind of like view on. It was interesting. It was very intriguing, but I felt like well, these are like stories you know right, right, right. <laughs> of people that existed or exist out there in a very mm-hmm. theoretical world mm-hmm. and i met uh you know my spiritual mentor and master who i have a continued relationship with sure. and i just spoke to him yesterday and so you know i felt like this was a to be honest it was like a spiritual fathering because i felt that i didn't grow up with this time in the household and um, shortly before I actually um, gave uh, the beya to him, I uh, got married. I was married actually at the age of 19. And oh. I was working at, and I met him actually at an Islamic school. And so I, this is, you know, you know my wife who, uh, whom I had met actually uh, towards the end of high school. And then in undergraduate, we decided early on to sort of get married. And that itself has a long story, but nonetheless, I'm she's uh, uh, of Indian heritage background. Uh, her father's Gujarati, mother's Hyderabadi. Oh, well, interesting mix. Both there, of us are right? Hyderabadi, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and so we had this sort of intercultural marriage. Mm. I met my sheikh, and I, you know, he taught me how to uh, be a husband. He taught me how to be a father. He taught me how so. to be a Muslim to practice Islam in a very practical, lived experience way, something that I was, I think, missing and searching for, that I was looking into. Mm. I don't know, it's like books that can only teach you so much, right? Correct. And, you know, talking to just imams on an informal basis and just asking questions and very, to figure it out on your own. Is, very ad hoc. Uh, yeah, exactly. This is way more, this is much more of a disciplined approach when you Absolutely. take on a, a teacher. Um, could you, um, is he from the subcontinent? He is, Which he study? Is, he's yeah. Qadari or not? I know uh, he has Ijaz in the ch- Chisti, Chisti Tariqa, predominant, okay. although we have uh, Ijaz from like four different Turuk, uh, Suhrawadiyya, okay. Qadariya. And Naqshabandiya as well. Um, so, uh, alhamdulillah, yeah, alhamdulillah, I was attending his his uh, uh, spiritual discourses and majalis, his hadith lessons. Um, I studied some other things with him uh, as well, and I just, you know, stayed in his sohba and his mentorship. And uh, meanwhile, at University of yeah. Toronto, I'm doing my psychology studies, okay. and I find that there's a very interesting kind of Parallel in the sense that I'm studying psychology and they're talking about human nature. They're talking about, you know, uh, human behavior, right. thinking, you know, transformative processes. How do you discipline behavior? How do you change behavior, relationships, etc.? And then I'm studying this with my sheikh and these majadis relationships and changing human behavior, developing human character, right. you know, changing human thinking and emotions and all of that. And I'm thinking, wait, there's no conversation between these two worlds that seem separate from one another. Mm. And so that's where it kind of piqued my curiosity and my interest to say, wait a second, there's something missing. And in particular in academia, and when I was doing my academic studies, I noticed, well, we got all of these guys who are uh, European men who are talking about in the 20th century uh, and, you know, late 19th century about human nature and philosophy, all of these names that none of my, you know, my, my, my forefathers could even pronounce their names of. My grandfather couldn't, you know, <laughs> and wouldn't even know how to pronounce their last names, let mm. alone know who their ideas were. And so right. we thought, I thought to myself, this rich heritage that I'm interacting with, which is a very lived experience, it's not just theoretical, it's also applied and practical. And it had a profound influence on influencing me and actually correcting and redirecting my own beliefs about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a father, what it means to be a husband, what it means to be a son, Mm -hmm. the mature, you know, sort of way, the prophetic examples, the lived experience, the Sahaba, and then all of the tasawwuf literature on how to refine human character, how to adjust Mm -hmm. and come to know your own deficiencies and then how to rehabilitate those deficiencies and how to acquire 
virtues mm. and for those who struggle with certain virtues and how to tailor towards the nature of each individual. All these conversations were missing. And so I thought to myself, you know, I had talked to my sheikh about this. I said, you know, I had wanted to go one of two ways. I was thinking either I'm going to go and drop this and I'm just going to study in and just study Islamic sciences, or I'm going to just going to have to go through this process and figure out how to navigate it. And I talked to my sheikh and I had told him at that moment, I said, you know, I'm thinking about kind of going, you know, maybe studying Ayn. And he said, you can study Ayn, you should continue to do so. Uh, but he said, don't abandon what you've started yeah. with, your, with your studies. Mm -hmm. He said, keep going. So I did. And I thought, well, I'm going to try to bridge some of this, try, try to, in my bachelor's, try to figure it out. I would actually ask my chef, but like, Freud says this about this, and, you know, Carl Jung says this, and that, and he's like, it was very interesting. You'd say, that yeah, sounds interesting. I think that some of that can be true. Some of this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And you present yeah. other sorts of perspectives. It was like sort of a, my beginnings. Yeah, yeah. but there's no... There's no resources for you that There's are no answering resources. those questions, exactly. right? Exactly. Right, right. There's absolutely no, no resources. The closest thing that I came across was when I came across Malik Badri's book on the dilemma of Muslim psychologists. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, he's passed away now. And he was a Sudanese uh, scholar who had trained as a psychologist in England, in the UK. And then he had gone over to uh, Malaysia, the international uh, University of um, uh, um, Islamic University of Malaysia. So he kind of spoke to me in the sense of, oh, like there's somebody articulating a problem with some of these Western ideas that don't necessarily fit the Muslim experience. So that's the most we had. We didn't really have yeah. manuals, books, a whole lot of literature, uh, not very much, let alone a practice of Islamic psychology or Muslim psychologists attempt like endorsing and doing Islamic psychology. Mm -hmm. And so then I decided I really want to kind of... What would you say mm -hmm. is the sort of fundamental point of departure between, you know, Islamic psychology, if you will, and sort of the Western, you know, a uh, modality of psychology as developed by whether it's Jung or it's mm -hmm. uh, Freud yeah. or anyone else? I mean, I think what's very clearly evident and probably yeah. the most obvious answer is that it's a uh, it's a discussion about the soul without the discussion of God, okay? okay. It's a godless science of the soul. And I say, the reason why I say yeah. the word soul, although many psychologists may cringe at the idea I was going to say, soul. like, I mean, <laughs> right, the Western, does it even recognize right. the ruh or the, or the soul? Yeah, but while psychology, the name is actually the science of the soul, right? That's what it means. Psyche means soul. And traditionally, they had this debate of the mind and uh, mind and soul, mind right. and body problem, yeah. which in essence is mind is not brain here, mind is soul. So I see. they believe okay. that yeah. there's something governing this human body, including the brain, that's directing that mm. the the human being. And eventually, they sort of abandoned the uh, discussion and took a physicalist, monist. Um, reductionistic, materialistic, materialistic approach, and they right. said, who cares? Let's just study the human brain um, and try to sort of model it after the hard sciences, uh, only that which we can observe, positivism, empiricist, empiricist. Kind of orientation. And so it's there's a bit of a contradiction, however. Mm -hmm. While they attempted to try to do that, uh, psychology today is very much a mix of empiricism and philosophy. And I would argue that the sort of, I would change the word philosophy to theology. I believe psychology contains a theology of human psyche, mm. of the human psyche, because they are explaining the human soul. How so? I'll give you a couple of examples. Freud is talking about drive theory mm -hmm. we can't see that we can't validate or find that through an empirical study mm -hmm. talking about human nature good or bad or evil or animalistic um if we're talking about whether the human being is ultimately good like humanistic humanistic theorists or postmodernistic humanists mm. rogerian ther therapy for example 
that believes that, you know, human beings, good is what human beings want it to be, like a postmodernist, right? Mm -hmm. It's all in your subjective experience, and I'm not supposed to judge that, and I believe that everybody has a pathway towards self-actualization that's natural and pre-wired. Where's the science to this? Yeah. Is this science, right? right? This is philosophy, right? And so sure. we have a philosophy, and rather a theology of human nature that then constructs the psychotherapeutic methods of that school of psychology. So you might say, well, how is this empirical? Here's the empirical part. The empirical part is if you can demonstrate that it works to help people when they come into your office and they leave, that they're no longer depressed or they're no longer anxious. Uh, outcome driven. Outcome -driven. So, or, or, or outcomes yeah. will validate the school. There you go. And therefore, now you're an empirically evidenced school of psychotherapy, despite the fact that two different schools will give you the exact opposite explanations as to what happened and how they got better. Right? Because right, because the results may be the same or the right, but results how, driven. So results work, but how it worked? That's not the empirical part. The empirical part is that it worked. So we we'll say <laughs> your school is empirically evidence, uh, right? Interesting. And so this is okay. where you know we sort of yeah. miss the part about wait. There's a lot of philosophy or theology involved in the explanation of how human beings actually got better and how they got there. You you very masterfully brought us here and transitioned from speaking about your experiences and your life story into uh, the conversation I think that, you know, we really did want to have, which is the, the sort of model that Khalil Center aspires towards. Mm -hmm. But before, I guess, as we get there, um, I'm also curious that we, we talked about some of the sort of differences or salient differences between the Islamic model and the Western model. Mm -hmm. uh, what about similarities? Like, again, as a, as a purely layman, uh, but armchair, you know, so psychologist uh, who is fascinated by human behavior. To me, like, for, for example, Freud's theory of, you know, the ego, mm -hmm. the superego, the id, to me, that resonates with our own understanding of the various nufus, for example, mm -hmm. nafsa la awam, you know, la wama, nafsa la mara, etc. Mm -hmm. Do you do you agree with that? Or and, and that's just one example. Sure. Obviously, you are far more uh, learned about yes. this, and I would love for you to sort of maybe shed some light on where you see some of the overlap and similarities. Yeah. No, there's definitely similarities because when we're talking about the same subject matter, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if we look at the kind of our epistemology, uh, by epistemology, I mean our sources of how we uh, discover and arrive at conclusions about any particular sub subject matter, uh, we, one of them is going to be wahi, right, for Muslims, uh, revelation. revelation. Mm -hmm. And then for, uh, but we also allow for empirical evidence mm -hmm. or sensory knowledge or knowledge through reason and rationality. And so, reasonable people may arrive at similar conclusions and there's no problem with that, right? Uh, we have a whole tradition of philosophy, Islamic philosophy and thib, ancient thib, that is derived uh, largely, right? Some of the this basis from therapeutic. ancient Greek medicine, yeah, right? Sorry, thib, and uh, therapeutic, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so therapies medicine, and, right? and medicine so, in general, prophetic and medicine. So, mm -hmm. And so we don't have any mm. sort of Bombs with uh, deriving what we call quote unquote Western knowledge. There's knowledge is knowledge, right? It doesn't have a Western or Eastern yeah. per se. If it's true and it's corroborated by our tradition, then we adopt it. Right. Um, there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Mu'min. Wisdom is the lost commodity of the believer, wheresoever they find it, they are most entitled to it. Now, hikmah, the term, uh, is the same term used to describe the hakim, who is the physician, the the, per, the person of medicine. Now, medicine largely came from ancient Greek medicine. So why is he called the hakim and why hikmah? Because of this hadith. Because wherever the Muslim finds hikmah, wisdom, mm. they take it. So they took it from, so they looked at the ancient yeah. Greeks and they said, oh, they have hikmah. So let's take that, right, and adopt it. And so we have a, as Dr. Rajab says, one of my teachers, a multiplex kind of a perspective. Uh, we put knowledge in its appropriate place. And that's why the hadith concludes with, and they are most entitled to it. That's right. Because we have the capacity to be able to complete the story or tie it back to God. 
back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas the knowledge may be incomplete. Imam al-Ghazali, for example, discusses various positions on whether a person could quiet the scattered, busy mind. Right? Mm -hmm. people, what was that the big issue in psychology? Everyone's minds are always busy with <laughs> social media and technology and so. everything that's going through our minds. We're always busy with uh, something, right? And he talks about all these theories. And he interestingly have lists of various different positions of various different philosophers on the issue. At the end, which is very unique, I won't tell you what he concludes with as to what his conclusion is as to the answer, but I'm just demonstrating this point. Sure. He says, they all are coming at it with kernels of truth, but they haven't encompassed the whole matter. They're debating with one another because they're miss. Mm -hmm. This guy's saying something true, but he's missing a piece of the puzzle. This guy's saying something true. They're not saying wrong things. They're just speaking past each other. Yeah. And he provides a reconciliatory approach. So now coming back to your question of Freud. Freud did derive and is influenced by the Judeo-Christian tradition, or the Western tradition rather, and they believed philosophically that human beings have two primary drives, shahwa and ghadab. Shah, this is the Arabic terms, of, of course, derived yeah. from the ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and you find this in Aristotle, Passions. right? Shahwa being appetite of drives, mm -hmm. and ghadab being survival or aggressive drives, survival drives, okay? Now Freud says, takes this, and he perverts them, right, pun intended, <laughs> and he says, we human beings are driven by the libido, so sexual drives, and by the way, appetite of drives for us, not restricted to sexual, that's one of many, <laughs> and then the other is aggressive drives for power and dominance, and so he says, human beings are driven by these things, and now, when you repress that, or you don't allow expression of that by a Victorian era that promotes celibacy and that sexuality is bad altogether, okay, or you're victimized or you're powerless to speak your mind and therefore you're subdued, you have all this repressed conflict. And so he says, what do you need to do? You need to get it all out. So cathartic experiences, free association, get in a room and speak all your nasty thoughts that go through your mind, right? And say everything that comes out. So that's a cathartic experience. And we're saying, look, you got some of it right, but you're taking this a little too far and you're missing a very important piece. Human beings are not just appetitive and sexually driven and survival drives of anger and aggression, but human beings are ashraf al makhluqat, that they are the most noblest of creation, that they have a ruh and they have an aql. And that they have, they are a khalifa on the earth, on this earth, a vicegerent. They have a capacity to escalate above animals and to live in a much more civilized, higher order, meaningful way. And so we're missing the part about the human being training and taming and restraining themselves for higher order reasons to connect with God rather than what Freud says is, to make sure you don't get in trouble by the by the social context. People don't view you bad or you don't get in trouble mm. by the police. So the conclusion is they do what? They come up with one of his you know, you know, later um, kind of neo-Freudians in the 50s. Uh, um, I'm forgetting his name now. But uh, he, he comes up with, the, he's the father of uh, the, the sexual revolution. So he comes, he takes Freud's ideas. And the idea is yes. if you can create a society where you can remove all the inhibitions that allows you to express all your inner desires, then you'll have a healthy society because none of them will ever have repressed conflict anymore. Mm -hmm. Right? They'll just be able to express whatever they feel. And here's where we are. And there's like, you know, books and literature on this about how sort of and by the way, he didn't find a whole lot of clout in a lot of European countries that he went to, but eventually he found it comfortable home in the United States and his ideas took off in the 50s. Yeah. So Kinsey follows him. Actually, he's part of the sexual revolution mm -hmm. and produces the Kinsey studies, but he's influenced by this other gentleman that starts this process. Got it. But these are all new neo-Freudian kind of expressions. Mm -hmm. So you can see how psychology, by the way, is very powerful, right? You can see how it can influence an entire societal wave. Um, and psychology is very powerful when we look at Abu Ghraib and the military complex and 
uh, the uh, whole marketing and business industry is all behavioral economics, right. right? All the phones and where you put your attention. It's all psychologists behind the scenes directing and wandering where you put your attention, what you click on, fastest rates. And they all sort of, you know, work on then studying yeah. communal human behavior in order to do what? Make more money, Definitely right? <laughs> sell you something. And so that's sort of the capitalistic yeah. interest. And so this right. is what happens when well, it's, you... it's being co-opted by the capitalist yeah. interest, right? I mean, like you're saying, I mean, it's essentially, you know, it's human it's study. It's the study of human behavior and then monetizing it. Exactly. Right? The, Whereas exactly. the best uh, minds of the last decade have not been fulfilling a higher purpose necessarily. They've been figuring out how to exactly. increase clicks on, uh, on social media uh, posts and, and um, mm -hmm. squeeze out an extra few cents mm -hmm. per page view, right? To, um, quote, to I, quote you, like uh, perversing it. Yeah. yeah. yeah sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I think no, I just wanted to, question. you mentioned higher purpose, completing the story. So I just want to bring it back to your story, yeah. which is the founding of the Khalil Center. Mm -hmm. So how do you go from completing or pursuing your studies to then the spark, uh, the idea to yeah. create something like this. So how, how do you sure. get to the point where you're completing your story? Yeah, the, the inception or um, development and creation of Khalil Center. You know, Khalil Center, alhamdulillah, was established in 2010. And just to tie it to kind of where my place was as uh, in this story of where I was, uh, my own journey, is that by this time I've kind of uh, finished my master's degree. After I finished my bachelor's degree, I decided to go further. I did my master's degree alongside of it. I also studied more seriously the Islamic studies um, in a more formalized manner. Uh, I'd come over to Chicago with my wife and child at that time, studying locally at some of the local institutes here, uh, eventually finding uh, myself from Dar es Salaam, and I was studying very closely with Mufti Azim. Actually, mm. before it was even Dar es Salaam existed, uh, we were, um, you know, I was at at his home basically oh, studying. Because right now it's just down the street from yeah, you. Yeah, it's down the street. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. And then, uh, and then later on, and then I had met Sheikh Amin, so I'd taken some coursework with Sheikh Amin. Sheikh Amin gave us kind of well, like a private study of uh, going through kind of an Islamic counseling model for about six months. Mm. Um, He's really a, a, a hidden treasure, isn't mastermind. he? Mastermind. So Sheikh Amin is one of my, you yeah. know, very, very well uh, respected and revered yeah. uh, teachers of mine. And so, uh, you know, I was then studying at Darul Qasim, and then Mulana Bilal Ali Ansari, who is uh, actually on the board of Khalil Center, uh, as well, a very good friend of mine, as well as my teacher. I would have lots of conversations with him uh, about these issues, and we would do a lot of sort of interesting investigations. Sometimes we would involve other ulama. So you, so you consider Maulana Bilal your teacher? Yeah. I yeah, don't know if you know this story, but... He is but, my teacher. I studied mashallah. Mishkat with him. <laughs> <laughs> mashallah. <laughs> yeah. We did so with, with, with Sheikh Amin years ago, um, 2008. Uh, but anyway... Um, uh, because I had I had initially reached out to him because mm -hmm. uh, I know we we're on a thread that goes back like a year. So I, you know I don't <laughs> I don't I forgive you for not knowing the sort of uh, you know the entire uh, timeline of that thread. But it uh, it, it it began with me um, coming across a lecture that I think Maulana Bilal gave mm -hmm. around the you know TIIP model. I was fascinated by mm -hmm. him. So I reached out to him about having him on the podcast, and he said I'd love to you know I'd love to do it. I'd love to talk about it. But I think in fact you'd be better off talking with Dr. Hu. Mm -hmm. So, so someone, and you consider him your teacher, yeah. but your teacher is recommending you, mashallah. <laughs> Just wanted to tell you yeah. that too, so that you know for the yeah, record. Just, uh, mashallah. Sorry, so you were no, saying. No, no, no problem. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, we used to have all these sort of conversations. So then, you know, at this time, while I'm kind of studying at these institutions, I finished my master's, got my, you know, preliminary license, and... All these people, like now within our community, are coming to me because I'm giving khutbas and I'm like sort of, you know, sort of front facing by being put in front by some of my teachers to, uh, you know, do these community events. And therefore, people are starting to say, hey, you know, I need you to speak here. Can you speak to that? Can you do this consultation, whether it's a school or a masjid, take this case? And so I decide I'm just going to form this organization which initially starts off as just a small kind of um, you know set of operations 
Uh, I'm like the only therapist, basically. There was right. another brother who was a good friend of mine uh, who, was, um, uh, who was doing sort of like religious consultations, more of a theological pastoral care type of thing. I see. And, and then, real quick, I mean, that's a, that's a bit of a, I mean, it's, it's bold to say you, you had some, some questions and you all of a sudden created the Khalil Center. I'm presuming there's a little more layer to it in terms of you must have been getting a lot of intense questions and really been seeing a major, major need. Um, just in your, in your community work, I presume you were, you know, when you say giving khutbahs, you know, that was resulting in people, maybe t the topics you were speaking about were resulting in people contacting you and then you were just uncovering layers and layers of agreed, issues. Agreed. And I think, look, this is now, if we go back 2010, 2009, these are, uh, now th there's not as much. It's very interesting. It's not that long ago, right? You're I mean, right. and, and uh, how, how the changed. rhetoric yeah. around mental health and, and the openness and the responsiveness That's and interest right. in mental health has changed. At that time, there wasn't very many resources, and there were some Muslim psychiatrists, maybe some you know some yeah. private Muslim therapists that the community didn't really know, and so there wasn't a lot of resources available. Mm -hmm. And here, I'm getting the flood of like now you kind of open the layer or take the top off of something and then you can see inside right. all of the kind of, or, uh, you know, troubles within the Muslim community. Right. And then add on top of that because people generally would go to imams and religious leadership. And then those religious leadership, because they knew me, they said, go to Human because he's our guy now, yeah. right? right? He studied this stuff. This is what he want. This is what he, he, he prepared himself for. So go to him. We, we sort of endorse him to, you know, take care of some of these issues of yours. And then that's where I kind of, so I set up shop and I said, hey, look, I'm going to make this a, um, Instant. my day job, basically right. okay. what I okay. do. And because of so much community activity that I was doing, I we you know I conceived of it as a not for profit eventually, but just to get operations started, we just start off in uh, LLC. After a year, I had my first intern who just um, wanted to come because they wanted to work with Muslims, and she found out about me in the community. I didn't know what an internship was or how to start that at that time, and so we got set up with their school. A um, couple of people joined me very shortly, Dr. Fahad uh, Khan, who was like also thinking about similar issues of Muslim mental health. He joined on and it started to really grow pretty quickly and we started to get pretty busy very quickly. Uh, 2013 is when I actually penned all of the, these theories down as a result of all these work group and study and conversations around models of mental health care. And there was a publication that was published in the uh, International Journal of, you know, Psychology of Religion and in 2013. And so that became kind of the formation, the, the preliminary model for TIIP. You published that, it. You along with... Yeah, I yeah, was yeah. Uh, uh, oh. uh, the, the, the primary author. And right. then... And then the Amber Haq, who was actually a senior to me that I had corresponded with in Malaysia. Okay. And uh, he um, kind of, because my I didn't know how to publish anything. This is like the first time that I'm writing something like <laughs> yeah. this. So he's like, hey, this stuff is great. Like, let's, and he gave me some direction, some mentorship. He wrote a little piece. And then he said, let's give it to this journal that I know. And we did. And it went out there. Then people start reading it. And right. then it just sort of takes off from there. Okay. Conference presentations you know, sort of um, academic settings, symposiums, um, other work group meetings. Um, I start going to, you know, Muslim Mental Health Conference, which is in Michigan. So it starts to get very active, yeah. right? And and question is, what does the demand look like at the onset and then through the years? Is this something that the minute you create it, there's this backlog of demand? Or is there a bit of a period where you have to essentially... Um, advertise that or educate folks on the the benefit and right, then that right. fed into an eventual demand because i know i know at yeah. this point in time there's a huge backlog in demand of these types of service but was that yes, always the case true see when people talk about the stigma i i think i believe that the stigma we've sort of got it all wrong with the stigma stigma of mental health uh it's my belief that the stigma has to do more with the field than the people okay than the people who are receiving care interesting uh, okay so okay. I wanted to, to talk the about the industry of mental health okay. and the mental health uh, practitioners and does the recipients of mental health. Here's why. Um, I mean, 
all of us, we go to a doctor if we have a health problem, go to a financial expert if we have financial problems, go to a mechanic, you know, all of the, we go to experts. It's a human instinct to go to experts. Mm -hmm. But why don't we do it? Well, why didn't we do it, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> for our mental health mm -hmm. practitioners? Well, you know, there's a history to this, right? I mean, you know, when uh, a psychiatry was introduced, it was underdeveloped into the Muslim world. It was a medical model reductionistic approach that dealt with severe mental health diseases. Community psychology did not exist. And when it did, it came in on the backs of Western theories that was largely secular to a very religious peoples. And it pathologized many minority populations, and it was underdeveloped. The process of deinstitutionalization and community psychology is also relatively new right. in the Western world, right? That's true. And so yeah. it marginalized and it created a stigma for itself and a bad left a bad taste in people's mouths, and that was inherited. So that's why you'll see the old generation be like, why do you want to be a psychologist? You work with crazy people? You know, Why do you want to be a psychologist? So, you know. So only insane people go to psychologists. Well, those were the things that they had learned or adopted. Um, and so, but people were going somewhere. Where were they going? They were going to imams. They were going to clergy. People did go places for their problems. It's not like they were, I mean, some of it was within the family and on their own. People went places. They went to imams. And so for me, because I occupied this kind of like, dual space role, right, within the sort of religious uh, uh, sort of uh, community establishment, I didn't face a whole lot of stigma, to be quite honest. I mean, some of it, because of my title of being a psychotherapist or psychologist or whatnot, because I was sort of endorsed or seen within sort of a religious um, uh, uh, community, right, and religious leadership community, then, you know, for me, like a lot of people were coming even at that time, more mm. than I could actually handle. What I had trouble with initially was to send them to people that joined me, right? And they didn't want to see those people because they were just therapists that were trained by therapy. And then they were working with me okay. and then being kind of exposed to different things through the work that I was doing. But there's this credibility and trust of religious leadership, right? And they're like, okay, I can go to Oman. I don't know about this guy. I don't know who this person is. I, I don't want a professional. It was still at the time where the imam had more credibility exactly. and trust than the professional. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And okay. now when we fast forward, though, into 2023, alhamdulillah, we don't really have that problem. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, when I... Which is, mm. I, I want to flesh that out because I think I, I, I would love your thoughts as to why that happens. And I think Omar asked this earlier as well, which is you brought it up when you mentioned uh, when we started transitioning into the development of Khalil Center because uh, something, I mean, 2010 was not that long ago. Correct. Yet in these 13 years or so, a lot has happened, certainly. But yeah. <laughs> pandemic notwithstanding. Right. But... But, uh, but 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 a lot has changed also. Correct. And some um, of it is surely due to the work you've done to educate folks on, on the benefit. Some of it is at, at a macro level. That's right? what I mean. Yeah. The macro levels, I, yeah. I think what I'm kind of, I want you to comment on. So when you mentioned stigma, I, I, I guess I would like for you to talk about the stigma that exists in the Muslim community about seeking out professionals that deal with mental health, period. Mm -hmm. Like there's a stigma associated with the very, the very act, if you will, or the very pursuit of seeking counseling or therapy or right yeah. fill in the blank with regards to mental health. It won't be the same with, yeah. with physicians correct? Yeah. or like you said, like we, we, we go yeah. to experts all the time, right? A lawyer, a, sure. a, a plumber. Yeah. But and it's with, a, and it's a two part thing. There's the initial just yeah. resistance to the idea. It's yeah. like, no, just read your, just read Yasin. Right. But then spiritual then, bypassing. Sure. Right. Spiritual, and then there's the stigma mm -hmm. or embarrassment of actually taking action and then and actually admitting to it to your family that's or whoever right. it is right so oh, it's yeah. a two-part oh, yeah. thing no no and i mean i'll even take it a step further i mean you know again in immigrant communities where it's like oh you know no no don't go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist they'll make you insane mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> like as if yeah. there's a vested interest in, right like okay it's or it gets conspiratorial like that. Yeah. oh 100 <laughs> percent. yeah don't go to you know marriage counseling. They'll split you up. They'll just yeah. tell you to get a divorce. Right. So there's almost like a conspiratorial aspect Correct. to it, in addition to the two points that Omar rightfully made. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, so that's part of what I was trying to say is that I think that 
because the mental health professional has generally occupied a very secular role mm. that has often in when you read psychology you assume people go oh look at what freud has to say about this look at what postmodernists have to say look at yeah. reduction i'm not going to go to a psychologist they're going to make me talk about my sexual conflict for example and how you have repressed conflict they're going to make our communal structure into a nuclear family individualistic culture that you know prizes individuation over family family collection and cohesiveness right Very for example yeah. so there are these things that we as an industry possess that would you know sort of scare people off certain from, people from a religious uh, from sensibility yeah exactly yeah. exactly like and the it's, it's more a very religious secular, you were yeah. the less likely it is that you'd be seeking mental health care from a professional because of the idea that the professional embodies western secular ethics or yeah. ideologies and and beliefs and even if they're a muslim they've kind of sold their souls for or you know by virtue of their training that's how they know what to do with you and so <laughs> right. this is where for, with the Khalil center we tried to flip it we flipped it and we said look we agree there is a problem with the way that mental health care is done and we critique mainstream reductionistic you know sort of ph pharmaceutically run you know, sort of Western paradigms and models. And people are like, yeah, like that's right. Okay. And then we say there, but people still value science to a degree. And we say, look, we can take the good of, si of the sciences and filter it out, the agreement stuff we were talking about before, and situate it within our tradition and our values. And then you say, that, then you got, I have a daughter who has bipolar. I have a, a marital problem. Who do I go to? And then yeah. you go to your imam. He's like, go to Human. He's like, oh, that's the guy that criticizes modern psychology and says we need to like integrate Islamic ethos. And stuff. Mm. Let's go. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So what I'm saying Excellent. is that you can remove some of those barriers for service delivery by virtue of the way that you often present yourself. Mm. Now you asked about what has changed. I think there has been something that has changed. A couple of factors outside of this on, a, on the macro, macro level. level. And yeah. on the macro level, as first of all, you know, we're in our second and now third generation in the Muslim community, right? So some of those inherited things of the old garb of what psychology used to represent uh, within our parents' generation, for example, may not have passed on as much to the next generation, number one. Number two, psychology has changed a lot. It sort of presented itself could as you, very... Could go you ahead. pause? Sorry, because I want to go back to the uh, intergenerational aspect you, you identified. Because that's not just limited to the Muslim community. Would Correct. you agree? Uh, and so to me, on a macro level, I feel if you look at it generationally, boomers, highly unlikely. Gen X, less... I mean, more likely yeah. to seek assistance uh, or therapy or counseling. Gen Z, millennials, very, very likely. Very likely. likely. So in would fact, you agree with that? Bra bragging about their therapists, right? Like, <laughs> I go to this guy, I got in with this person. No, you're in the cool yeah, club. Yeah, my yeah. kids tell me yeah, this. Yeah, my kids are like, yeah, yeah, my kids like are everybody's like, in therapy. That's, that's <laughs> right. It's, it's a badge of honor slash cool badge. <laughs> right. So Gen X, I mean. It's we, probably you know. something we're flexing privilege to in some way, right? Like, <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. true. Good point. It's Good true. point. So, so you agree with that then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And part of it, I mean, you know, I hate to say this, unfortunately, it's a reality is that resilience levels have also gone down. So our sick, like our sicknesses have risen in the sense of, you know, we know that the, the, the this generation is much more vulnerable. And they're well, like, we see it in, the, in mm -hmm. employment settings, for example, That's they're true. always looking for their unstable workers, they need to sort of switch jobs, or mm -hmm. they're always seeking a particular passion, for mm -hmm. example, yeah. um, they're less resilient, the they, kind of stuff they, that um, so Jonathan Hay talks about, yeah. right? Because it's, it's that's exactly what we're seeing. Yeah. So this mm -hmm. generation tends to be a little bit more coddled, mm -hmm. they grow up in, in safe spaces. Exactly. I, I, but I'm glad you mentioned and that. Safe spaces. Triggering and, safe spaces. And then so therefore, you know, everything needs to be kind of wrapped around me. And then what happens is that individuals are more likely to get psychological psychopathology and then yeah. they're likely to then go to mental health providers because also we've sort of 
you know, destigmatize everything. You see what I'm so saying? So true, it's not so just true. about the mental health. It's, yeah. it's okay for you to do anything because we got to sort of be non judgmental around everything with right. individuals. So, you know, we, we benefit from that as mental health providers, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's good for business. <laughs> right. But I know I'm, I really appreciate you saying that because I think it does, there's a flip side to it. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, we welcome the fact that people are astute and people are, uh, are, are more likely to seek counseling and therapy. But on the other hand, um, we've been coddled so much that we can't survive without it. And yeah. we need that pacifier almost. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you for bringing the, it. The like other that. piece uh -huh. too, is that I think human beings need mentorship and need relationships, right? Okay. I and mean, the idea of like being in a role models. And so when you've removed religion, theology, community out of the picture, then you need to replace them with something. Right. Mm. And, and I'm a mental health provider. I mean, I endorse mental health treatment. That's what I do. We have centers on this. Right. That's right. But having said that, I don't think that every person needs to go to a therapist. Right. There's a balance, meaning you need mentorship. You need counsel. You need direction. You need role models. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be much more diversified within our community. Right. And a lot of people may now be sort of turning to their therapist for that, right? And that's okay on some level, I want to say, as sort of like a palliative measure, right? But I think if we're taking the pulse of the greater community, we want to say, and this is also the other thing I'm wary of, is that, you know, mental health should not turn into a replacement for spiritual care either. Wait, you see that? Mental health care should not be a replacement for spiritual care. Thank you for bringing so that people, up as well. So people, you know, going to mashaykh, going to the traditional modes of going to, uh, you know, a sheikh or a bani, for example, religious communities, spiritual mentorship, for example, going to youth mentors and leaders, for example, these are really important parts of yeah. our communities that needs to be... Uh, sort of endorsed. And, I agree. And, 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 I mean, and, I think as much as we have, yeah, I think people forget uh, the metaphysical or the meta psychological, yeah. even perhaps, right? Yeah. If, they, if I'm creating a word, I don't know. But certainly, look, there are diseases that are certainly mental that in the past used to be diagnosed as spiritual only but now i feel like the pendulum has shifted to the to the op, to the other yeah. extreme where now everything can have right. a empirical or you know mental component whereas there are diseases that are spiritual there are cures that are metaphysical correct so correct. I, yeah. I certainly I really appreciate the nuance here yeah. oh, dr Homan. yeah no, no really yeah no i i i think you you spelled that out i think it takes yeah. a village right for the for to for any for all of us but you you explain the role. There's a spiritual yeah. leaders. There's role models who are mm -hmm. your day to day aunts, uncles, teachers. Yeah. There's medical professionals yeah. like Khalil Center. Right. Um, and I just had, I just thought of one other area that is uh, I'm seeing more of, which is life coaches. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to get too far off the 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 topic. But really quickly, if you want to comment on that, yeah, that would be. Don't super get me on life coaches because <laughs> you're not going to get a very positive answer. Yeah. I, you know, to be honest, I kind of I've heard that from other. Um, well, we had uh, Jabra mentioned it exactly when we exactly. had Jabra. On. So I, I almost kind of purposely asked the question, <laughs> yeah. but if, if you if, if you'd like to, you can answer that. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't have to. Yeah, I mean, so let, so the thing is, like, you you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to so to speak. Like, I can't say definitively, like, if somebody's a life coach, they're going to be bad for you. Um, but at the end of the day, it's kind of like you may get a good khatib once in a while. You know what I'm saying? That's like a physician <laughs> that has no you. any training. You see what I'm saying? Like the analogy. So like. You know, if an individual has no, you know, what qualifies in it, I mean, we're people who, uh, you know, ends in a nasa manazidahum, right? Like give people their due credit. And so in, we have expertise and we value, value expertise. And that if somebody just says, you know what, I did what you did, uh, like your study of, you know, 12 to 15 years of study, uh, I, I was able to do in like a certificate program uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and hang yeah. up a shingle and say that I'm a life coach. <laughs> And then they'll yeah. say, but I don't deal with mental health problems. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a catch-all. You didn't say but don't. You do, most people do. don't. You do. Most <laughs> but people you kind of do. Exactly. Most exactly. people, when they go to somebody, they usually can't deal with it beyond themselves That's or right. their local circle. So they go to some specialist, right? That's right. And then. That's right. And how do you differentiate? A lot of people that come to us don't know they have. They don't say it in mental health problems. They don't come to you and say, "I fit the criteria for DSMs." Yeah. You know, um, uh, this number of a set of diseases or clusters or whatnot. They say to you. I don't know what's going on with me. Like I can't yeah, get up. Uh, right. I have no motivation. I have no energy. And that's dangerous when you don't have expertise because you're not able to differentiate what's going on with that individual. A set of symptoms may be associated one thing with a set of other things with a set of other things. Yeah. And when you're blind to all of that, then you may in fact be doing harm more than good in some cases. That's right. right. I think it's too, th I, mean, I, I agree. I mean, hundred percent. Again, I wouldn't say anything negative about people who, who, who do seek, you know, life coaches. But what I'm saying is uh, I think the point that you make about there's been this sort of leveling of ex expertise that's happened because of social media and mm -hmm. other things where, you know, because social media can amplify anyone's voice, if, as long as they can play the right algorithm, a sheikh or a scholar or an expert or a, a specialist is on the same playing field as a person who is just a quote unquote influencer right. or a life coach or, right. hey, right. I know a lot, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and so therein lies that one problem. And I think, yeah, I mean, to me, it just like kind of an influencer, it just smacks of like the sort of modern kind of job titles that have emerged. Yeah. Like, whereas 10 years ago, you didn't hear about people who were quote unquote life coaches right, right, or, right. or 15 Absolutely. years ago, not to say that that alone is something that, you know, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that they have qualifications, but I just find it interesting or yeah. an interesting observation. Yeah. If, if we could then, I want to talk a little bit more about Khalil Center yeah. and then I really want to talk about, you know, the traditional yeah, Islamically integrated psycho yeah, sure. psychotherapy. And specific to the Khalil, Khalil Center, yeah. I think we're interested in how do you take it from a Scalability. local... Yes. How do you scale it? How do yeah, you take it from a local it? organization to one uh, that exists in the Bay Area, right. for example, right. or and yeah. all around the country? What and 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 how does that tie into your vision? Yeah. So yeah. You, it begins in Chicago. Was uh, I, I imagine it was a very conscious decision to move into the Bay. Yeah. Uh, as as people who live in the Bay, we're obviously curious as to why sure. that was identified. And then yeah, definitely talk about scalability. Sure. How can we kind of replicate this uh, in yeah. other places? Yeah, I mean, replication was intentional in the sense of yeah. trying to sort of provide this level of care to uh, large uh, populations of Muslims in different parts of this region, the country that we live in, and mm -hmm. then later on north of the border to Canada and Toronto, where I'm <laughs> Don't from. Don't forget right? your so, home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so taking it back there as yeah. well. And so, um, you know, there's a clear recognition that there was a lot of this sort of um, need and then also people just reaching out to us from different parts of the country and still do to ask for Khalil Center to show up in their communities and to set up a Khalil Center in various different parts of now, not only in the country, but in different parts of the world. So don't, don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, the name itself, I always thought Khalil Center was just like, you know, someone is a Khalil, like a friend or mm -hmm. a council, but that's not what Khalil Center, that's not where the name comes from. Is that correct? It, part of it. And there's a yeah. couple of uh, yeah. uh, things for the name. Right. The hadith of the Prophet وسلم, is that a person is upon the way of their friend, of their Khalil, rather. Khalil. Yeah. Khalil is a close confidant, see yeah. whom you turn to and share inner secrets with, that you establish trust with. So the, everybody is upon the deen or way of their Khalil, so all of you shall be mindful as to whom you take as your Khalil. Okay? And so we kind of put ourselves out there to say, you can trust us, inshallah, right? We are a Khalil, we're trying to represent Islamic ethos and parameters and values and to try to give you you know, healing and shifa and rehabilitation and to strengthen and, and, and make your lives and family lives better uh, influenced and derived from the principles within our own very tradition. Um, so we wanted to kind of scale that also because we felt like it's a prophetic mission, right? Uh, yeah. Is that, you know, um, it's a fardul kifaya, at yeah. least in this community, but also feeling a sense of responsibility that, you know, people don't have access to care or service. So where are they going to go? And this is why after COVID, we started the whole, I mean, we were doing web therapy, but we're doing it a lot more now okay. to be able to provide greater and greater accessibility. And then 
going to scalability, we said, well, hold on a second. We're not going to be able to set up Khalil centers everywhere in the world. And we don't have that many resources or staff, but here's what we can do then. What we need to do is take the models of care that Khalil Center has. Even if somebody doesn't set up a Khalil Center, they know how to do mental health through an Islamic framework and paradigm. That's where traditional Islamically integrated psychotherapy comes in. And this is yeah. where we create our three levels of training that uh, we created. And we started offering this in various different parts of the world. Our uh, you know, official first one kicked off in, at the Suleimania complex in Turkey, where, where I was living for the past two and a half years, actually. And so I was at Ibn Khaldun University. We have a PhD program there created kind of a track on Islamic psychology. And then we established, you know, part of Khalil Center's practices within the clinic that they had over there for for the community. And then we started offering these TIP trainings where people from all over the world, very diverse, right? 50, 50 therapists from all over the world, Western, Eastern, etc., came over to the Sunamania com complex, 600-year-old complex, right? Yeah. To be inspired by the Islamic tradition. And, you know, there was the Dar Shifa there, and there was a medical college, the Tib Madrasa in Turkish, right? That was established, that, that was there all around the masjid, which serves as an inspiration for Khalil Center's models. And then we taught people how to do and take their training and take Islamic principles and values and combine them. And then we do that in two levels. And then we offer a supervision where they have to complete 200 clinical hours under our supervision uh, weekly in order to get certified. And now you have some batches of individuals finishing off the TIAP training and they're in Sweden you know, it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's South American populations, for example, that yeah. they're serving our practitioners in different parts of Europe, for example. And now I'm actually on my way over to Qatar by the end of the summer to establish a program, the very first program in the world that is a, a, an accredited program on in applied Islamic psychology, clinical psychology counseling psychology would call it, mm -hmm. but it's a clinician development program. And they're going to have a clinic that is attached to the program that is modeled after Khalil Center. Basically, it'd be a teaching clinic. And so you're going to get students locally and internationally coming over to the program to then get trained from the get-go, from their master's, and then go on. And this is part of a replication strategy. So we go there, we establish a curriculum, experiment with it, establish right. a program, get some cohorts trained, and then we have some in Turkey, we have the certificate trainings happening in various parts of the world, and then they'll go off and establish clinics in any part of the world, okay. for that matter, and then start to do therapy. And the goal is to actually transform and revolutionize the way mental health is delivered, particularly for Muslims and beyond, inspired by our prophetic traditions. Would you say that the Bay Area then was like an initial exploration into the possibility of, of creating another chapter? And then realizing after a couple of years, and then of course the pandemic hit, Yeah. Uh, because I mean, Khalil Center in the Bay Area had a space. Mm -hmm. It was uh, being operated out of MCC, right. and Dr. Rani Awad and others sure. were involved. You had, you had clinicians who sure. were part of the program. Th then it no longer remained a brick and mortar. Yeah, uh, no, think, we do. It's oh, it's still, still at MCA. At MCA, MCA now. So, ah, yeah, so. I see, I see. So the idea of creating another chapter still, uh, at least in the Bay, yeah. is will, will remain. Will remain. And Have you considered, remains. as opposed to sort of the certification or training, let's say certification or academy model, what about kind of a franchise mm -hmm. or a licensing model where an institution can become a Khalil Center inspired or a right, Khalil right, Center right. Uh, endorsed? organization yeah. or institution. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, that's some, some things that we've sort of explored. Um, the only issue is sort of quality control and management. And when you, Oh, you have to name, yeah. institutionalize that. And then yeah. the other thing too, is that you have to sort of be able to provide the appropriate training that individuals sort of come in with. And so we've decided to, you know, really more so focus on certification and development Got of it. our you know, sort of intellectual property, so to speak, meaning like putting out the models, the mm -hmm. workbooks, the mm -hmm. translation works, the uh, trainings, uh, the programs, and rather than sort of us assume the responsibility mm -hmm. of setting up shop or 
you know, directing uh, and overseeing sort of um, therapeutic uh, quality control and management of an office, you can kind of do it on your own. You don't have to call it a Khalil Center. You just go ahead and sort of do it the way that's inspired by, by a Khalil Center. And inshallah, you have many. It'd be mm-hmm. the Ibn Sina Center, the Belhi sure. Center. It'd be, you know. Maristan. Uh, and they can. Ghazali Center. Yeah, is, is Mar- that, yeah Maristan. Maristan in, exactly. in the Bay But they would, um, in their credentials, Say something about like TIP the sort methodology, of right? Yeah, okay. yeah. That's that what I mean. I, I think I, I was just. I mean, I, I did development at a nonprofit for a while, and so for me, I kind of think still with that. Ha- yeah, maybe you uh, can join uh, us and you can advise us. <laughs> well, you know, and a, a friend of mine used to be your uh, head of development, uh, Kamran Chowdhury. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a yeah. lawyer turned development, kind of right. like me. Right. Although still. I went back to law, and I think so did he. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I was I was with Tetleaf as, as head of their development for a number Mashallah. of years. So that's why. I, I just, I, I still think of, uh, you know, think of opportunities where I think organizations can best retain uh, branding, but also uh, increase their uh, development opportunities by looking into these other models. That's Absolutely. why I couldn't help but think out loud. Uh, before we let you go, or as we let you go, then if we could do a sort of a slightly deeper dive into some of the elements that the, the therapeutic framework then mm-hmm. that that is TIIP, you could just talk about that and we'll shall sure, then close sure. out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, TIP is quite, <laughs> may take some time to explain, so I'll try to do it as succinctly as possible. I think something that we spoke about a little bit earlier in our podcast about um, this idea of, uh, you know, the psyche being a metaphysical component of the self, and it's not the brain, so to speak, but it is, you know, sort of remember mind-body problem Mm -hmm. we just Mm -hmm. talked about yeah so we believe that the soul is the soul and that we you know um have different names to describe uh the soul uh a unitary name might be the latifa rabbania that some of the scholars have described it as is essentially your metaphysical essence and that's kind of what we've used in tip to refer to the psyche i see and uh, now is that a composite of like the ruh because you also have like you know the heart Right. So the the reason why you don't use, that's just one unitary term to describe all of these other terms, all part of one essence, um, but they have different functions in when we use, like, when we use those terms, we describe different functions of the soul. What's required here is to actually review some of these definitions and terminologies, and actually in what we do in a sort of scholarly process is to do tarjih. Tarjih has to favor one definition or position over another, and then you construct a model where you define your terms, and you say, this is my model. And so that way, when somebody uses the term nafs or or whatnot, they may mm-hmm. say, oh, well, this scholar uses it this way, or somebody uses it this uh, way. Yeah. So that's fine. That's yeah. not what we intend by it. This is what we intend by there it. There you go. And yeah. so that's the process of model construction, is that mm-hmm. we have to clearly specify what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And so we have these, in our TIP framework, we have the psyche. And so at the heart of it is your qalb, right? Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so it's... um. You know, qalb is a store of of um, health and pathology, okay. or light and darkness, right? <laughs> Whatever people do leaves a impact on the heart. Qalb is that which turns, right? Like muqallib al qulub, yeah, muqallib al qulub, sabit qulub ala right? The, uh, we say to Allah, O oh, turner of hearts, turn our hearts towards, or keep our hearts firm upon upon your deen. And so the qalb is the store of health and pathology, blackness, health, pathology. And then we have aqal, which is your reason. And so that stores intellectual reasoning and belief. So your beliefs, for example, i'tiqad, right? Your beliefs are going to be acquired through a process of reasoning initially and then committed to and stored within your heart. Um, and we have the nafs, which we define as behavioral inclinations. I don't mm. have time to get into that, but sure. basically it's the part of you that does things automatically without thinking. It's your habits, habit formation. So it can be good or bad, right? right? A person just, you know, sitting and doing nothing, picks up a phone and starts scrolling through their phone. It's a habit, bad habit you got there. You weren't even thinking. And oftentimes when it's not refined and you don't create good habits, you have a falling towards a uh, male or inclination towards appetitive drives, which are comfort-seeking, 
And then you get angry, ghadab, when you yeah. are denied those mm. things. Like, for example, I need my evening tea. If somebody doesn't give it to me, I get angry. Cranky. Right? And cranky. But then I feel the <laughs> hang, craving. Hang, hangry. Hangry. Angry. Right? There you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And Fascinating. So, okay. And so the, that's the nafs, which wow. is our behavioral inclinations, our drive to do something even mindlessly. You might open the door to the kitchen, uh, uh, to your fridge, and you're not, you're, what am I doing in the kitchen, yeah. right? I just ate, you know? <laughs> you're looking for some sugary, you know, a thing, right? So it's habit formation. And then we have what we call ihsas, which yeah. is your emotions. And then you have ruh, which is your soul, that part of you yeah. that needs to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the part of you that feels a void when you're in the rat race and you don't connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When there's no dhikrillah, the heart hardens. So you need to yeah. feed that soul in order to get that sound qalbun salim, heart. And so we take this model and we apply it to all human behavior. All human psycho psych psychological processes. So, for example, you can have diseases that originate mostly in your mind, aql, mostly in your nafs, mostly in your emotions, or mostly within your spirit. And they're all an interconnected system. They influence one another. Let's give you a couple of examples. One which is aql, thought-based. You have bad thoughts, or you have incorrect beliefs you believe that certain types of people are bad or you've had um you've internalized notions of masculinity that are incorrect for example what does it do it makes you act behaviorally mm -hmm. in a particular way out of because of your false beliefs it makes you feel a certain way you can say depression for example when somebody doesn't meet my need because of my false expectations of marriage that i feel depressed and sad then i start what? Yelling and screaming and throwing things habitually and instinctively, right? Through my nafs. And then what happens? I have a spiritual disconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I don't have a meaningful, a correct sort of approach to uh, this process. So what do we need to do? Fix your thoughts. So then you can have pornography addiction on the nafs. You can have appetitive addictions. You can have uh, food addictions, food. for example. You can have social media addictions. And so... What happens? Well, too much social media is also associated with greater degrees of dissatisfaction, depression, and anxiety on your emotions. Your thoughts, you start to have jealous thoughts or you start to think of, think certain negative thoughts, right? And then you start to feel, uh, spiritually you feel less and less disconnected. So what do we need to do? We need to rehabilitate and go in and fix the nafs. And then emotionally you might have trauma. It's okay. not a thought-based problem at all. Somebody's been sexually abused, has been raped, for example, Allah forbid, right? So what do you need to do? Well, it's an emotional, visceral reaction. It's whenever I have, am triggered. It's not an intellectual problem. You know, half of religious problems are not intellectual problems, they're emotional problems. People will say, I can't go into the masjid, or I see a bearded guy and like, and then I have a visceral, visceral reaction. It doesn't make any sense. They may even know that it doesn't make sense, right? Because it's an emotional problem. It's just trauma associated with it on an emotional level. And so we don't deal with emotional problems through intellectual reasoning. We don't try to change your beliefs when we know the problem is actually emotion. It's like somebody may say, why do I need to wear hijab? Or why do I need to pray? Or why do I need... And then you realize, wait a second, this is an emotional problem. And it's impacting their thoughts and beliefs. But it's actually at the heart of it, it's an emotional problem. You fix the emotional problem, the thoughts start to resolve. And so, so we go in and we fix the emotions. Spiritually, for example, you have a spiritual-based problem. And then we say you have a kind of void, distance, disconnection in life, for example, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we say, that's what you need. You need some dhikr. You're disconnected. You have a meaninglessness in your life. That's what your depression is from. So depression, anxiety, they can be as a result of multiple different things. But we then conceptualize each patient accordingly and create this formulation by looking at their background, looking at their particular situation, conceptualize them on this framework. And then we use interventions, both from the Islamic tradition, as well as through behavioral sciences. And we integrate them to provide effective solutions to remedy that cognitive restructuring process of their thinking or rehabilitate their addictive habituative uh, problems or do trauma-based uh, processing therapy or do spiritual-based uh, care. And so then we kind of work with them in that way and that fixes the whole system. So that's kind of the conceptualization of Beautiful. that TIP no, model. You, you laid it out beautifully. I, I'm just like smiling ear to ear and grinning ear to ear because it's just, it's so sophisticated. Mm. 
and nuanced and beautifully blends our tradition as well as sort of Western advancements and modalities of psychology, you know, psychotherapy. It's just so heartening to see that the community now has progressed and maturated to where we can have these conversations. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, no, no, yeah. really, to you, to Khalil Center, all the people who are involved. I, I imagine that as you are diagnosing people, going back to that idea of a, a metaphysical, not only cure, but a metaphysical cause mm -hmm. for an ailment. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of things like uh, that are also part of our tradition, Rukia and mm -hmm. things of that nature. When do you and your clinicians determine that therapy or uh, approaching this from a purely psychotherapic uh, approach is only going to get us so far? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at some point, you know, an expert's going to have to be brought in. I'm sure. not saying you go full-fledged exorcist. Right. I, I don't say that flippantly because, I mean, obviously we, we recognize sure. that there are those elements. So how do you, and at what point do you say, okay, now we're dealing with yeah. The ghaib. Right. So so those issues of ruqya lie beyond our scope. Yes. Of the center. So we, you know, our mental health center that, you know, sort of uses Islamically integrated um, methodologies of being able to work with sure. people's psychological or psychospiritual kind of conditions. Mm -hmm. Nor do you deny Correct. the fact. We okay. do not deny. Right, right, we right. do not deny. Yeah. And we would say that what we would say here in these situations is that if an individual feels like, oh, they have sort of black magic or sihir or, you know, or nadar, um, uh, like hasad, ayn, for example, um, or, you know, jinn possession or something like that, we don't preclude them from being able to go ahead and seek sort of ruqya services uh, out there. Now, at the same time, we also don't necessarily provide a recommendation. We say that's sort of on your own accord, just due to the liability. I'm not talking about mental health liability, but more like... You know, Islamic liability because yeah. we just don't know who's who and who who can can necessarily go out there and seek. So yeah. one would need to sort of go out there and investigate what services are available, and to avail themselves of those services. While at the same time, we would say that they're not independent of one another. The psychological can impact the metaphysical. The metaphysical can impact the psychological. That's right. That's and right. so. Um, one can still continue their sort of psychological care yeah. uh, along with that. There are some, actually many instances, and in fact, I would say majority of instances where people will come in and they'll say, oh, I, you know, I'm it's a gin or it's something a gin. like that, yeah. mm -hmm. or sihar or something like that, and then it fits a perfect profile of like a psychological condition. Mm -hmm. And we're like, mm, I don't know about that. Uh, but we still don't dismiss. And what we would do is we would say, do the sun the sunnas, uh, the read your idol kursi, ma'udatayn, for example, your fatiha yeah. before you go to sleep, read your du'as. We have prescribed some du'as. We actually have a du'a book here, actually, that we give Th our patients, Thank you for, for that example. gift, by the way. Yeah, jazakallah. Yeah, so we sort of work with individuals to say, look, you can do these things and have yaqeen that Allah Ta'ala will put shifa in this and that you know if there's any effect of uh, jinn or sihr or anything like that Allah Ta'ala will take it away and we're going to proceed with the psychological care yeah. but if an individual is like we're like oh this is, seems very kind of outside of the uh, conventional kind of presentation of a of an issue uh, uh, and needs medical metaphysical uh, attention then we would say you know maybe that's something that you want to look into as we mature and we grow as a community, as uh, we, we have institutional uh, maturation occurring within the community, I also don't want to lose sight of and the connection to things that make us unique. And I think Definitely. like, for example, the Catholic Church, by way of one example, has gone that way where it's almost like these like things are dismissed as superstitious practices mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. sort of brushed under the rug, right. not really recognized or it's in, it's in hushed tones. You know, I think we can uh, take ownership, you know, in the fact that we do believe in it and we Absolutely. recognize it. And, you know, here's some, here's an approach to it is all. And I wanted to thank you for indulging me with the conversation around Rukia and supra rational and metaphysical aspects to any kind of conversation around well being and certainly with regards to mental health well being. So, I really do appreciate that. As we begin to wrap up, though, I wanted you to have sufficient time to explain to our listeners how they can support you know, the remarkable work that Khalil Center is doing. I wanted to first call attention to the fact that when we walked in, a lot of the branding about Khalil Center says a Zakat Foundation project. 
sort of as a byline. Is that mean that it's affiliated, supported entirely by Zakat Not Foundation? Entirely. You know, they're both independent not for profits, Port Little Center directly, but um, Zakat Foundation is we kind of fall sort of an umbrella organization of Khalil Center, and we receive a lot of support from them. Uh, they support us financially. You know, Mr. Halil Demir is actually on our board of directors. They also provide us like infrastructural uh, resources, a lot of collaborative projects that, for example, we do. They've actually endorsed Khalil Center as their mental health kind of wing. So wow. They kind of put all their eggs in one basket to say, this is yeah. our mental health program that we support. So we're a Zakat Foundation in that way. Wow. While we do have a separate budget and we have a separate not-for-profit status, yeah. um, they do support us both through funding and infrastructure um but they don't you know cover yeah. say our entire budget That's it's right. they cover a percentage of it in order to be able to support the care that we uh provide uh while we you know sort of get help from the community through donor uh fundraising as well as some other grants and yeah. some of the fees for services private donors Private donors can still write a check, absolutely, and that check uh, and those contributions can still be zakat eligible in some cases. Uh, they have to designate zakat. Okay, yes. and, and then you know how to allocate those resources absolutely. to absolutely. programming that is zakat eligible. They would go to clients that would yeah. fall below the top. There you go. There and, and real yeah. quick, uh, speaking of clients, uh, are you taking just two questions about your clientele? Are you taking folks across states, and also do you take children? Children, um, we don't have a lot of room because uh, we have only a couple, a handful of. Um, therapists that can see children and so we have a, a, a need and we don't have a lot of therapists so you would tr try it out you know you put in the request form and see what the wait time would be like um, in terms of across states yes and no I not I, I wouldn't say not all 50 states but for do cover a lot of states and some of our providers are actually licensed in various states um, and some of them have this sort of broad coverage through what they call like the, the Psy Passport, which allows them to kind of practice across different states. So you just have to go on the website and see what we have available or put in the order form. And then we just get back to you and let you know, hey, we could provide services in your state. Or we could say, unfortunately, we're not able to deliver services in your particular state due to these restrictions. Here's our recommendations. Do you, I imagine you have therapists and clinicians who are employees as well as those who are like 1099 sort of. Well, uh, actually, they're all employees. They're all employees. They're okay. All employees. You don't you don't work with we a model like, where. No, we don't do that. Contract. Kind of, no. Yeah. No, okay. We don't do that. Okay. And then yeah. I imagine in operationally speaking, you also have full-time employees who handle the operations. We're actually having a staff retreat starting tomorrow, by oh. the way. Oh, okay. And on the staff retreat, the guest list was 80 people. About uh, 55 of them are going to be able to attend. And these are across you know, Toronto, Bay Area, Southern California, New York, you know, here sure. in our Chicago office. Alhamdulillah. So it'll kind of bring people up together to do a spiritual recharge. Sheikh Amin's going to deliver the first talk on Friday, for example. And then we have a series of professional development as well as, as, well as spiritual development and Islamic psychology kind of retreat and activity-based kind of you know, opportunities for people to get together, rally behind the mission, yeah. uh, work together. So alhamdulillah, we have good uh, sort of infrastructure. We have full-time marketing person, operation, and we have a clinical director. Uh, we have a assistant clinical director. We have operations uh, uh, director. Uh, we have several administrators. We have a full-time, you know, director of marketing, for example, mm -hmm. director of development. Alhamdulillah, we have a pretty solid infrastructure. Beautiful. And, you know, 13 years into the organization, Alhamdulillah, we've kind of learned and grown <laughs> and sort of developed sure. an infrastructure to try, to try to really do what we do in the most efficient way possible. However, I'll say this, we often get a lot of wait lists and we may still have a wait list despite having 80 people on our staff. That's because as you started with Khalil Center has become alhamdulillah a household name. And so because there's not a, a lot of organizations doing what we're doing, the demand is still way more than we actually have the capacity to be able to deliver, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, but we're continuously working on cutting that down and so any listeners therapists li interested in getting certified want to yeah. offer therapy in you know islamically integrated way uh they're welcome to reach out to us and uh okay. and, and 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 we are sort of hiring and recruiting but there has to be a good fit so okay. we always do a very meticulous kind of uh screening of the candidates to ensure that they're going to fit within the culture it's an amana we're saying we're yeah. khalils 
And so we don't want to throw anybody at, you know, the people who come to us with an expectation of getting, you know, um, certain kind of care. May Allah give you all the tawfiq. It is such a needed endeavor and service that you offer. I can't support it enough. Listeners, if you're listening or as you listen, please consider becoming a supporter of the wonderful work that Khalil Center is doing. The website is? KhalilCenter.com. Yeah, you can find out all the information you need. It's an extremely thorough website. You can find out about the clinicians, the services that they offer, how you can contribute to the work that's doing, and also seek the services that they offer. So... Uh, Dr. Homan, I can't thank you enough for your oh, time. No, I know you just thank came you. back from uh, your overseas travel, and yet you took the time to sit with us. Thank you so much. Listeners, as always, if you like what you hear, you can reach out to us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Feedback, criticism. If you want to become a supporter of our little humble effort here, you can go to patreon.com and slash diffusecongruence and become a patron of the show. As always, check us out, leave a review, and catch us on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Mm-hmm. <laughs>